Terrorism has been with us in various forms throughout modern history, but recent attacks both at home and abroad point to a growing kind of terrorist warfare. Joining us now for more on this emergence in New York, New York, Scott Atron, anthropologist at the French National Center for Scientific Research. He's also the author of Talking to the Enemy, Violent Extremism, Sacred Values and What It Means to Be Human. In our nation's capital, via Skype, Wesley Wark, visiting professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. And with us here in our studio, John Thompson, Vice President at Strategic and Capital Intelligence Group, and Janice Stein, TVO's Foreign Affairs Analyst and Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management at U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs. Welcome to all four of you. Uh, Wesley, John, Janice, I'm going to get you to hold on for a couple minutes. I'm just going to talk to Scott to kick things off. And Scott, I want to begin with something um, that you wrote in your book. You spent years researching and, and talking to terrorists and in, in your book, Talking to the Enemy, which came out a handful of years ago. You wrote that terrorist networks are generally no different than the ordinary kinds of social networks that guide people's career paths. It's the terrorist career itself that is most remarkable not the mostly normal individuals who become terrorists. So as a quote-unquote normal person, Scott, this, this feels a bit unsettling, I think, to a, to a lot of people. I want you to uh, elaborate on what you said. Terrorists are mostly normal individuals. How so? Well, if you look at the sort of, you span, they span the normal distribution in terms of intelligence. I mean, in terms of socioeconomic status, it used to be the same thing, although for various reasons, uh, more and more marginal elements of society are getting involved. But like many other networks, about three out of every four people who join it, join it through their friends, about another 20% through their families, and very few are actually recruited. Most are self-seekers looking for something in life. It, in the case of, of these people, it's, they're mostly um, young adults in transitional stages in their lives. Um, immigrants, students, between jobs, between girlfriends, having left their native family and looking for a new family and a sort of sense of significance. So that's not very, very strange. I mean, that they lock into the, this, what you call the terrorist path is a very interesting phenomenon, but I, I wouldn't even call it terrorism. I think calling it terrorism um, is, is counterproductive. We're now, we're now faced with a global jihadi movement of world historical proportions. And although they're drawing these marginal elements, much the way the anarchist movement did, or the Red Brigades, or even you know, some elements of the IRA, I think it's a much more dangerous phenomenon now than just a criminal, a set of criminal activity. Okay, if we're not calling them terrorists or we're not calling this terrorism, what are we to call it? A world jihadi movement. And that's what, that's what we're faced with. And they, they are um, drawing in many people from these marginal groups and in transitional stages of their lives. And there are ways to treat that. But overall, the problem now is how do we deal with this global movement? Okay, uh, you know, some people would make the argument that um, these, these individuals are, are brainwashed by a violent ideology. How, how does that assessment sit with you? All right, that's nonsense. I mean, brainwashing comes from the Korean War when about 100 Brits and Americans didn't want to go back from Red China and North Korea. So this idea of brainwashing came about and they made a film, The Manchurian Candidate, but it's mostly nonsense. Also, they're not really cells and they're not really recruitment. I mean, Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State basically fund operations or draw in people as attractors. Uh, Al-Qaeda used to fund about 15 to 20% 20, 20 of their uh, applications, of which uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's plan to blow up um, the, uh, the Pentagon and the World Trade Center and the Capitol were one. Uh, the Islamic State is drawing people from all over to establish the caliphate. But again, they're mostly self-seekers, and they're not brainwashed at all. I mean, they lock into a particular um, ideology because they're out there looking for glory and significance and adventure, and this offers that to them. But no one's out there recruiting them actively, really. Very little occurs in mosques. You have to be quiet in mosques. It occurs in fast food restaurants, picnics, barbecues, kids playing soccer. Okay. Um, I want to just put um, some examples to, to the kinds of people and the kinds of attacks we're talking about. Um, there have been many. I want to go through some of them uh, that have happened uh, in the West recently, and then I'll get this broader discussion going. So let's just take a look at this. 2013, a couple years ago, Boston Marathon bombings. Three people were killed. 264 others hurt. That same year, uh, British Army soldier Lee Rigby was killed outside his barracks in London by two British men. 
This past October 2014 in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, Quebec, Warrant Officer Patrice Vincent was killed by a Canadian citizen in an attack with a car. And of course, two days later in Ottawa, Corporal Nathan Cirillo shot and killed outside the National War Memorial. Last month, in December, an Australian citizen held customers and employees hostage at a cafe in Sydney, left three hostages dead. And of course, the tragic events in Paris also last month that all told resulted in the deaths this month, pardon me, that resulted in the deaths of 17 people. Other examples as well, Janice, but um, you know, 10 years ago, we would still be talking about those highly coordinated, large scale 9-11, post 9-11 sort of, sort of attacks. How would you characterize the evolution of terrorism during the past 13 years? Well, we're certainly seeing a change and I call it um, distributed. Um, very, and, and the network analogy is a very good one here, actually. Um, is, so a distributed network is where people become members of a network. One node lops off, it doesn't really matter because there's no hierarchy. And that's really what we're seeing and that gives a far greater role to individuals in the network who can take action on their own. Where I would probably disagree just a little with Scott, and it's a question of interpretation, is on this issue of recruitment. Yes, it's correct they're not being recruited into an organization because uh, these networks have evolved beyond that, but they are being recruited by videos uh, uh, and we see them on the internet. Uh, the, and when, in fact, those who are alive after these attacks, when they're interviewed, they talk about the powers of the videos by imams like Al Alawaki, for instance, which was instrumental mm. for many of them mm. in recruiting. John, where are you on this? I mean, as you see the last decade and a little playing out, I mean, are we in a new phase of terrorism? Yes and no. Uh, terrorism actually doesn't really change much. Um, one thing that's always been true, uh, and this is where I agree with Scott entirely, uh, is that people allow themselves to be recruited. You know, there's always choice involved. Um, but the other point, of course, is that terrorism is always working in competition with whatever defenses the authorities have. So the big plot terrorism that we saw you know, in New York and, and that Al Qaeda are trying to do, it doesn't work anymore. I mean, they haven't been able to get really. Meaning, we're better able to. Or the authorities are better able to defend against them. Yeah, we, we've picked off every single plot, except for uh, the Madrid and the 7/7 uh, bombings. We picked off almost every plot before it developed in North America. So distributed, you know, the lone wolf sort of thing. But again, this this is old. A uh, hundred years ago, you know, you had all these people who were self-proclaiming themselves to be anarchists and grabbing a gun or putting a bomb together. And then you find the real anarchists saying, well, we, we never heard of this guy. He doesn't subscribe to our papers, never joined our movement. Uh, but, you know, these people are acting out on behalf of the anarchist movement alone. And, mm. Terrorism has always had a number of individual actors that are acting out for the ideology that they voluntarily adhere to. Well, see, so where are you on this? I mean, it, it, is it changing fundamentally, or is it, you know, an adaptation, a continuation of much of what we've seen over decades and decades? I'm, I'm just for the fun of it, but not just that. Let me disagree with all my colleagues and say that I think that there, are, in fact, are two, if you like, strategic models for jihad in the 21st century, post 9/11. One, uh, the model that we're familiar with on the basis of historical and terrible experience is the Al-Qaeda model. And the Al-Qaeda model, as bin Laden and his close colleagues imagined it, was to create a vanguard global jihadist organization that would be, in fact, a command and control organization that would draw adherence to it, that would operate out of a safe haven or territory from which it could launch attacks. And, and its you know, ultimate success, though temporary one, was, was the 9-11 attacks themselves, though he was, these were preceded by others. Bin Laden was unable to continue on with that model of a centralized command and control uh, global jihadist uh, movement, largely because of the kind of counterterrorism measures that were taken against him. But he has, I think, a successor in the form of the current ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, which, although it wouldn't necessarily proclaim these links, is in fact attempting to do something, I think, very similar to what bin Laden originally intended to do, in part by establishing themselves in territory in Iraq and Syria, proclaiming a caliphate, trying to be the vanguard organization that al-Qaeda can no longer be, and, and they are in direct competition with what remains of al-Qaeda. The second model, which we, we've alluded to, but which is distinct, I think, 
is a model uh, that was theorized, in fact, by a, 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 an Al-Qaeda veteran, a bit of a renegade, uh, a man of mystery by the name of Al-Suri, who composed this remarkable uh, manifesto that made its way onto the, uh, the web in about 2005, 1,600 pages in total, which said there are two paths to uh, global jihad. One he called the open fronts path, which is, is basically the kind of warfare that's taking place in Iraq and Syria to establish a state. The other he called individual jihad terrorism. And, and uh, that he, he you know, was really basically calling for what he, what he described as guerrilla warfare in urban centers, in the countryside, conducted by individuals with the purpose of, as he saw it, easily undermining uh, the will and capacity of societies to respond, demoralizing them, exhausting them, so that they, in his manifesto, would withdraw from the fight. So I think at the moment what we have, in fact, is both forms of the pursuit of jihad uh, occurring simultaneously with lots of overlap. Uh, and, and one of them, I think, the individual terrorism jihad that al-Suri talked about, probably more dangerous uh, in the long run, although defeatable, uh, than the, the model uh, that is proposed by ISIL. Okay. Um, everyone agree with, the, with Wesley's assessment that we're sort of on different tracks here, but it all sort of falls under the, this, this banner? Well, it, the terrorist has always had to sort of consider a way in which someday the ideology will be implanted on an entire society. I mean, there's been other theories as well. You go back to 1969 and uh, Mary mini manual for the urban guerrilla and the classic sort of Marxist revolutionary strategy. And there's, an, again, an awful lot of overlap. And in some ways, actually having a, an open fight, you know, like against ISIS, where they're actually trying to form a semi-conventional military is something we could welcome, because it actually gives us targets for once. I, I want to talk about, um, Janice, with you, um, you know, ISIS, because of course, you know, we're over there trying to get a grip on ISIS, if I can put it that way, Try, trying to defeat them to some extent. Are we at combat? Debatable, depending on the semantics and who you ask. But there is this ongoing dispute between the two more established groups, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. Al-Qaeda's leader denounced Islamic State. So I explain this to me as it sort of pertains to inspiration for homegrown terrorists. We have um, two Al-Qaeda-linked brothers. How do we understand two Al-Qaeda-linked brothers and an Islamic State fanboy coming together? In Paris. In Paris. I mean, yeah. I, so, you know, it, it's interesting, actually, because I, I think there's a big difference between Al-Qaeda and uh, Islamic State, uh, although they both um, have tried to inspire uh, jihad and, and to, I, you know, I, I, I would say it's not everybody, of course, always has a choice. But there is a very active recruitment strategy which is based on the web. And there's lots and lots of evidence for that. Al-Qaeda never declared a state. Uh, and uh, Osama bin Laden, that was postponed way into the future. And the emphasis was, in fact, on attacking those from the far abroad, the United States, Britain. Uh, Islamic State is very different. Its priority is to establish a state. It's building state-like institutions. It's much more familiar. And I agree, it's easier to handle in its paradoxical way because it has a civil service. It has tax inspectors, and it would like to, ha it would like to fight a conventional war. Both of them, however, are sources of inspiration. And this is the key. Uh, for young um, angry, in many senses, dislocated um, uh, Muslim males who feel uh, isolated, marginalized, and infuriated uh, by what they see Western governments doing in the Muslim world. Mm. So yes, it's not a question of poverty. They're not usually poor. It's not a question of education. Many of them have gone to Western educational institutions. Uh, but they're angry. I mean, that's the thread that ties these together. So you could have two. But they are angry, arguably, about seeing poverty and a lack of education in other parts of the world. They're angry at what they think is happening in the Islamic world, and they blame that on the West. That is the common thread. When you strip everything else away, that's the common thread that runs through the whole story. Mm. So they look at governments in the Arab world, and they say these are puppets of the West. 
So they, the, everything is traced back to a West which is decadent, corrupt, and deeply, deeply anti-Islamic. And that's what fuels the anger. The fact that two brothers uh, were inspired by the Islamic State and, they, uh, and a, a friend was inspired by Al-Qaeda, uh, they're not interested in the differences that we just talked about, that one declared a caliphate and the okay. other didn't. They, they're just appealing um, ideologies which give meaning to their life and motivate violence. Okay, Scott, you know, we'll use your term, uh, you know, global movement, jihadism, violent jihadism. Is, are, we, are we at a tipping point as you see it? Yeah, I mean, this has been building up since 1979, which was a crucial year in human history when the hegemony of the West really um, began its long decline. Uh, that was the Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan, which uh, instigated the world jihadi movement, uh, the Sunni movement, and the uh, revolution in Iran. And the Muslim world has now been in a sort of virtual civil war uh, ever since. The caliphate is a very interesting take. I mean, you can compare, say, bin Laden to John the Baptist and um, Baghdadi to their version of Jesus. Uh, the caliphate exists. Uh, the caliphate was interrupted. It was an interrupted destiny in, in 1924. It had been around for well over a thousand years. And it's being revived, and for these people it exists. Now, there are two groups, for example, just in the Islamic caliphate. There are the groups that are actually fighting and form the administration, the shura, and the military commanders of the Islamic State. And many of them are former Ba'athist uh, officers and uh, discontented uh, Sunni administrators from the provinces of Anbar and others that were far from the power centers and have been shafted by events in Iraq uh, and in Syria. Uh, and the other are the foreign fighters who are much more, in a sense, ideologically motivated, but they're born again. They don't have any real uh, consistent ideology or uh, religious training at all. And they come together, uh, in fact, uh, to fight. And it's a very, very potent force. Uh, it's like all other insurgency movements uh, in, since World War II, which on the average have been able to defeat uh, armies and police with 10 times more firepower and manpower. I mean, there were 300 fighters in Mosul, and they defeated an army of 20,000 in Iraq. And I sort of disagree that it would be easier to defeat the Islamic State than these you know, young people are coming. The Islamic State actually wants the United States, Canada, and European Union to intervene directly uh, in the area. I mean, their Bible is called, is basically a, a, a tract written by Abu Bakr Naji back in 2004 called Adharat Tawahush, which means the management of savagery. And it was an attempt to bring back the caliphate after its collapse, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the argument is that now that the world order, the nation state order, has failed in the Middle East, and everybody is aware of it, they've tried everything, democratic liberalism, fascism, communism, socialism, we have our chance. We need about 500,000 fighters. We're going to attack here, but we're also going to attack in diverse places all over the world to maximize the dispersion of the security apparatus of our enemies. So we're going to attack journalists. We're going to attack things like Charlie Hebdo. We're going to attack tourists. Because if we attack these things, then we know the security forces have to disperse their protection all over the place. This is going to show the weakness in Western societies. They're only going to be able to fight these localized fights. They're not going to want to intervene directly. If they do intervene directly, they won't have the staying power. And in the end, we'll win. They are. Again, in his volcanoes of, of, of jihad speech back in November, he laid out, Baghdadi, how across the world they're going to establish classical vilayet, classical provinces, province of Khorasan, Afghanistan, where Islamic State is moving. Boko Haram has pledged a sort of allegiance, but they're sitting on the sidelines Waiting to know, waiting to find out whether they're going to jump in, although they're imitating it. The Jamaat Islamiyah, people like Abu Bakr Bashir from the old Jamaat Islamiyah, has pledged his allegiance to it. The Muqaddis in Egypt has pledged their allegiance to it. We don't know if the caliphate is going to have the form that the Islamic State has given it. But again, this is an idea uh, that is very, very hard to defeat, and it's going to stay around. And my, 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 my inclination is again that we've got to deal with that rather than terrorism per se. Okay, uh, there's a lot to unpack uh, with what Scott said, I'm, and I'm gonna go around the table. And Wesley, let me begin with you. One of the points that Scott brought up was that ISIS, the Islamic State, 
want us to be there, i.e. want the West to go in and intervene. Pick up on that for, for me. Is that how you see it? Um, it's hard to know, and I think it's easy to overinvest in a notion uh, that an organization like ISIL, with, with its kind of manifold challenges that it's facing in terms of sustaining itself in the field against an allied military coalition, trying to build up the caliphate, trying to, in fact, recruit and sustain itself, uh, in, invest heavily in a, in a coherent grand strategy. Um, uh, there is no doubt uh, elements of this, and there will be elements of it in their rhetoric. Whether uh, their primary goal is to encourage the West to intervene against them, uh, as it was often said of Al-Qaeda in terms of its post-9-11 plans, which I think was, to be honest, a fiction, uh, I, I think is at, at best unclear. Um, elements in ISIL, including al-Baghdadi, may have uh, various visions of a grand strategy. I don't think it amounts to a coherent strategy quite in the way that Scott uh, has presented it in such a clear uh, strategy to, to you know, establish the caliphate around the world and deal with Western resistance. But to come back to a point that, that Janice made uh, in, in, in suggesting that uh, recruitment happens, I would absolutely agree. But I, I also think it's important to understand that the organizations to which potential jihadists uh, are attracted to, those organizations, they're attracted to in terms of the ideological message they're putting out. And there are, I think, in that context, important distinctions to be made, and distinctions, in fact, that ISIL and al-Qaeda and its various affiliates want to maintain. It's not one global movement. It's, it's a rivalry of various uh, terrorist groups, in which, at the moment, ISIL seems to be the principal threat uh, because it's on the ascendant. To come back to one last thing, Scott's point about have we reached a tipping point, I don't think so. I think that's the kind of language we use to scare ourselves. Uh, but uh, it's only a tipping point if we assume that there's some kind of trajectory that we can see that is going to give more and more capacity to uh, jihadist terrorist groups and remove capacity from uh, our counterterrorism efforts. And I don't see us anywhere near that point. You know, there, there's so many big questions that we're, that we're trying to wrestle with here. We are seeing um, citizens born, raised in the West, little or no official connection to these established groups, ISIS or Al-Qaeda, being inspired by their message. And, and I guess the instinct or, or the pull for some of us is just to throw them all into big, one big coherent group, the bad guys, you know, that they're all just bad guys. Is that a good idea? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, the, again, there is a coherent ideology with a global plan, um, but it's, again, it's coherent in very, very broad brushstrokes, uh, not in, in precise details. But there are people who align to it. Now, there's some people who align to it because they're they're just acting out. I mean, we had the uh, the couple that wanted to put bombs in the uh, the legislature in Victoria. I mean, on behalf of Al Qaeda, and they turned out to be about as Muslim as a bacon sandwich. Um, but there, there are other people again who deliberately adopt the narrative. I mean, they self-alienate. It's a deliberate choice to alienate themselves. There, there are other people who you know take on all these grievances because that's part of the package, um, so and that's the story they want to follow. I, I'm in violent disagreement, as we say. <laughs> On two points, really. One, I'm actually not impressed by this idea of self-alienation, although, of course, there's a choice. But actually, uh, you know, when you, we have interviews, the kind of material that Scott and many others have provided, these are angry people. These are angry young men. They are not making a deliberate choice to become angry. They are angry, all right? And so let's, let, uh, it's too easy if we say it's a deliberate choice. Secondly, um, uh, let me agree here with Wesley. There are real, they, this is a divided camp. Uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIL, uh, there's a, a, a real rivalry there. Boko Haram is about to declare a, a caliphate in, in a large province in northeastern Nigeria. There will be then two caliphs, and that is the old story mm. of, of the Muslim world. There has always been more than one caliph. So we need to understand, I mean, if we think of this as a master global plan, which is coordinated, we really, I think, are, are going to get the story wrong. In this complicated, fragmented, 
world of, of Muslim jihad, which is the world that we're talking about, how are young people recruited? And this is the change. They are not actively recruited into an organization. They are attracted by the ideology and by the release uh, that the ideology gives and the targeting that the ideology provides to their anger. And that's a, a big problem then I, in then our I guess, own society. I guess the big question becomes, by what you're saying, Janice, is how the heck do you kill an idea? It's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. And you know, we know some things, actually. There's been some good research done, so we actually know some. So how do you kill an idea? It's local communities and local community leaders. And it's, you know, I, I'm actually hearing a lot of anger now from uh, Muslim community leaders that they are being asked to shoulder this responsibility because they feel the whole community is uh, being stigmatized and it's not fair. But what do we actually know that works? We know two things. We know that when local community uh, leaders are unequivocally clear that this is haram, that killing and murdering is outside the scope of Islam. And they involve the mothers, that, the, that these kinds of acts uh, injure the mothers of these young men. Uh, that's the first part of the message. But the second part of the message is equally important. We want you back. We want you back in the community. If you renounce this, um, you are welcome as a member of this community, and you are isolating yourself mm -hmm. from the community. Um, it requires real leadership. It requires better coordination between our authorities and the communities themselves. It's hard work, and it's over the longer term. It's not an instant fix, but it's the only strategy that works. Uh, Scott, let me ask you, you know, you spent time talking to, to terrorists, and let me pick up on, on, on John and Janet, Janice's disagreement about this anger thing. How do you see them, and, and how do we kill an idea if this, is a, if, if this is what this is about? Well, you know, I agree that uh, local community work can help, but I think it's, it's way beyond that now. I mean, people talk about a clash of civilizations. It's really a crash of traditional territorial cultures and a generational uh, communication. So young people are looking peer to peer across the internet. You know, I'm in a place like Sulawesi, which is between Borneo and New Guinea. These people were literally cannibals three generations ago. They all want to go and die in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Palestine. I mean, how the hell did that happen? It, there was a massive media-driven political awakening, and somehow we have to go into that. And the solutions I see coming out of our governments are from, are from Planet Fruitcake. First of all, they say, okay, well, let's preach moderate Islam. And I say to them, did any of you ever had teenage kids? I mean, when does moderation appeal to anyone at that age? <laughs> You've got to give them sort of heroes uh, and glory. And secondly, the, you know, most of the, not this panel, but most of the counterterrorism experts having the foggiest idea about what kinds of narratives, what kinds of stories are, are, are coming, out, coming out to attract these people. I mean, Islamic history was a parallel history, very independent from the Western history. The West was pretty much like we look at Africa now. It was a dark continent until very recently. And there's a very, very deep and very rich history. I mean, everybody in that part of the world knows the stories of the first four caliphs, you know, the father Li Abu Bakr, the giant Omar, the billionaire Othman, the generous but valiant uh, Ali. Stories like we know of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Napoleon, none of our people know anything about that. So what we're trying to do is offer liberal values, which are even failing in our societies. I mean, we do studies where we show that the traditional values of liberal democracy do not engender costly sacrifices among our own youth, which is why, for example, one out of every four young people in France between the ages of 24 find, have a favorable attitude to ISIS because it's offering something glorious. So yes, deal with local communities and try to get local communities to, to take responsibility. But I think much more important is trying to plug into this, again, massive media-driven political awakening, which is very narrow in terms of, 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 of once, you, once you plug into it, you can be as narrow as you want and uh, work, work in that space. And I don't see us doing that at all.
John, go ahead. Actually, more to the point, one of the things that ISIS is offering right now is a chance to relive the stories of, of the seventh century, of the original expansion of Islam. I mean, the nom de, de guerre of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is deliberately chosen. And again, they are behaving in many ways like the Arabs did in those first few critical decades. So they're inviting all these youngsters, you know, come on down and, and get in the big adventure. Yeah, it's like the old days. Right? It's, it's just like down. the old days. Yeah, it's yeah. King Arthur, come to life. Yeah, but get you know a suit of armor and join. But you know what happens when those kids come on down? Because we, we, we have some good data here too. When those kids come on down, they usually don't stay. And the reason they don't stay is the reality doesn't match at all uh, this dramatic vision and the hopes that they have. And so we get... Uh, but it's worrisome that they even go, Janice, right? Of course it's worrisome that they even go. And, you know, again, there's some... We are into an, uh, a new period where tracking people who go and trying to stop them before they go is exactly what our intelligence agencies and our governments are doing. Um, but we also know something about the group that c has come back, right? Because there were about 3,000 Westerners who have gone, um, and we know something about those who have come back, and here's how it breaks out. 75% turn on it and go back into their own communities and try to work with peers saying, don't go, you're going to hate it. It's nothing like the movie says it is. 25% come back really angry. And that's the still a large proportion, right? Yes, it is. One out of four coming One back. One out of four really, coming back. You to, know, it was build, sold as build, right? Went yeah. over there. It's exactly what I thought it would be. It was awesome. Come uh, on down. And that's right. And not only that, I'm coming back, yeah. and I'm and I'm going to now do something uh, terrible here. Commit acts of violence here. But let's focus also on the three quarters who come back and say the movie didn't didn't play well at all in fact and don't go and it, it's really interesting we have women by the way as you know this is not only young men mm. but we have 15 16 17 year old women that are going not only get married which is what the media tell us but actually the involvement fighting and they're the ones that are coming back most disappointed because they're marginalized they're not given a role they are put functionally behind curtains so they're coming back and there's very interesting work these women are doing now um, in countries like France and Spain where they're saying don't buy this movie it doesn't at all sound um, like it's supposed to when we play it again okay we got about eight or so minute minutes left and I, I just want to uh, turn the page a little bit here and, and I want to go back to what something that um, Scott wrote in his book you read you have good quotes in your book Scott um, and this is what you wrote in your book perhaps never in the history of human conflict have so few people with so few actual means and capabilities frightened so many and I want to go around the table on this one Scott let me begin with you I mean for the average Canadian Ontarian watching this program, or American for that matter, how would you characterize um, the real threat that it poses to us? Well, I think the real threat has been, um, you know, publicity is the oxygen of this particular movement. And given the way our media and our political, re the relationship of our political establishment to the media is, it has become a very dangerous phenomena in part, in large part, because of the hysterical reaction to it. I mean, take all of the, take the events you've mentioned, except for the Madrid bombing, say. Take the Boston bombing, for example. I mean, these three sort of, these two schnooks, basically, um, who weren't really recruited by anybody, they picked up the idea of making a pressure co cooker bomb. And the world was put on world military alert by the United States, which spent close to a billion dollars, locked down the city of Boston and uh, in order to capture these two guys, which they eventually did. And then they're calling the pressure cooker and they're, they're actually prosecuting these, these young people uh, under, under the Patriot Act and calling it a weapon of mass destruction. I mean, when you have that kind of hysterical reaction, then any such event is amplified by orders of magnitude way beyond what it actually represents. But that's a very real phenomenon, because once it is amplified, it does become real. And I think that's the, very, that's the danger, the, the great danger we face, at least in, on Western streets. Okay. And of course, the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda know this very much, and they want to bring the battle to Western streets for that very reason. Okay, if it's being overhyped, though, Scott, are you, uh, I mean, give me my advice. Am I just not supposed to worry about this stuff? Is there a real threat against me and Canadians and Americans? 
Sure there is, but treat it exactly, for example, the way the Israelis treat the, the threat. I mean, certainly not greater than Columbine or the shootings in Connecticut. Okay. Wesley, where are you on this? I mean, how, how real of a threat does this pose to, to we in the West? Well, let me let me just disagree with Scott, uh, alas, on this. I mean, I think we have to uh, be realistic about um, uh, the nature of responses and the nature of expectations around um, dealing with terrorism. On the expectations front, uh, it has to be said that um, I think the widespread public expectation is that somehow or another law enforcement and intelligence agencies uh, should have the capacity to stop all terrorist attacks. Now, that's an unrealistic expectation, but it, but it has a grip on the popular imagination. It has to be said on the, the imagination of our political leadership. Uh, but it would be helpful, I think, in future to, to kind of recalibrate those expectations. In terms of responses, you can always criticize a, a government for overreacting to a terrorist incident, but at the same time, the public is going to demand, as they have after every such uh, attack, that the perpetrators be caught and anyone identified as being part of a plot be tracked down. Uh, and that, that, is, that may require massive resources, particularly in the context where you're not sure exactly how the attack uh, uh, carried on. The critical thing, I think, to look at in terms of, of trying to decide whether we're exaggerating or underestimating uh, the phenomenon, whether we're living with too much fear or too little, is actually the nature of societal responses in the aftermath of attacks. Not government responses, not military or intelligence or security agency responses, but societal responses. And, and I, you know, I hope all my colleagues around the table would agree with me that in regard to all of the recent attacks from the, you know, the failed plot in Belgium to Paris, uh, to Sydney, to Ottawa, and further back, certainly from my perspective, the societal response has been magnificent. Uh, people were not panicked. People showed various forms of solidarity in very moving and unorchestrated ways. And, and from, from my perspective, this is actually one of the great counterterrorism strengths that we have, through actually no effort on the part of the government, established a significant foundation of societal resistance. And it's one of the reasons why I referred back to the, the uh, al Suri uh, great manifesto on individual jihad terrorism, one of the reasons why the whole rationale for it uh, is, is faulty. Uh, it is not going to change people's minds about how they want to live their lives, and it's not going to change people's behavior. Of course, we would like to stop all terrorist attacks. Not all of them can be stopped. We insist that when they take place, that they're dealt with. But I don't think, I don't see anything extraordinary uh, in, in that kind of response. And, you know, in a, in a future utopia, it would be nice to think that the scourge of terrorism, along with all kinds of other scourges, could actually be eradicated. I got two minutes. I'm going to try and squeeze you both in with a brief word, John and Janice. Terrorism has always been an opportunistic infection in the body politic. And if our collective immune system is intact, we're safe from it. Uh, and basically, our best defense is resolution by the citizens, a refusal to be panicked and a refusal to be angered. Janice. You know, terrorism is designed to delegitimize a government in the eyes of its own citizens. The record is clear. It is not working. It has not worked. Uh, it will continue. We will face acts of this sort, but it's a failed strategy, and that's what we need well, to it, understand. It seems to me, you know, watching various world leaders sort of speak to this, that they're almost like soft sell selling this now, that they've, they've, they've come down on their rhetoric from saying this will not happen in our that's borders. Right. They're sort of saying, of you better get will. used to of this. Of course it will. It's a very important part of educating the public. This is something that we have to, we cannot reduce this to zero. And driving to zero will produce pathologies. We live with this like we live with the threat of an epidemic, right? But we all go about our business, and that's, it's in that scope. I do not think this is the greatest threat. And I do not think, Scott, that you're right, that this is a small group of people who've terrorized the world to unprecedented degrees. Think about the Bolsheviks in 1917, and there's no comparison. This is not a grave, life-threatening threat um, to life as we know it. It just is not. Go ahead, Scott. You get the last word here. All right. There is a tacit alliance. This is not true in, in Canada, and it's not true in the United States, but there is a tacit alliance between the rise of a narrow xenophobic right and radical Islam that is tearing apart Europe, 
that is sundering the middle class, that is dividing them in ways that has not happened in Europe since the 1920s and the 1930s. And let me assure you, I was on the streets with Mr. Soros on Independence Day in Hungary, with people marching with black shirts and signs against both immigrants and anti-Semitic signs. And I'm finding this increasingly across Europe. And to tell you the truth, the middle class really doesn't know what to do, nor do the political leaders. It's not just a question of radical Islam. It's a question of the laziness, in a sense, of democratic liberal values that we have today. It's failure to motivate people. And I think that's a real threat, mm -hmm. especially in Europe. Listen, you four, thank you. Great conversation as always. Appreciate all your time. Scott Atra and Wesley Work, John Thompson and Janice Stein. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.